Good morning and welcome to uh, the live stream of the service at Plymouth Methodist Central Hall on this uh, Sunday. We're thrilled that you've been able to join us. There'll be people gathering now in the church in the centre of Plymouth, but we're thrilled that you can be part of the same worshipping community today. And it's great that you're here and that you've been able to join us, whether you're watching this live just before 11 o'clock or whether or not you're watching this back later, we're thrilled to have you with us. If you don't know me, my name's Johnny. I'm the lay pastor here at uh, Plymouth Methodist Central Hall. And um, Gareth has been away on holiday this week, hence why uh, one of the reasons why I'm doing this uh, video today. But Gareth is back to lead our service today, and Gareth will be preaching today and leading the service through, and um, looking particularly at... Uh, James chapter 3, I think we're up to today. Gareth um, has been leading mostly and other people involved as well through a series currently looking um, at the letter of James. I'm recording this video a few days earlier in the week. I'm actually sat at the moment in the chaplaincy or the pastoral and spiritual support centre, as we're now called, um, at Plymouth University. I'm the Methodist chaplain here. And I spend some time each week in the chaplaincy meeting with students, um, either Christian students or Christian um, or students maybe of of no faith um, or of other faiths. And um, I'm here as a representative of the, the Methodist Church or other um, denominations represented here. And um, it's a real uh, delight to be here each week and to be able to meet with students 
um, to talk about perhaps issues of faith and to offer support as part of the um, kind of student care that the university offers in a whole variety of ways of which the chaplaincy centre is one of those ways. And so I'm here today, we're thrilled that some students um, may be watching this online today or there'll be some in our church um, building today for the service. Um, it's something we long to do in the church is to reach out to students and be a home away from their home uh, whilst they're in Plymouth. I along with Denise, my wife and family, we host a midweek uh, home group in our house and we'll be meeting uh, this week around a fire. We're sitting outside at the moment. We're not quite yet ready to meet indoors with a whole host of students. We typically get about 15 along on a Wednesday night and we have a meal together and uh, open the Bible and share and pray together. It's a joy to be able to host that group. And so please pray for the students those in our city, those um, maybe from our church who are away from home at the moment. I've been in touch with a few of them this week and they seem to be settling in quite well to uh, where they are. Um, just to add a couple of things to the notices that you may have already seen, we've got our prayer meeting this coming week on Wednesday at 7.30. It's going to be on Zoom this week. We're alternating each month, one month on Zoom, one month in person. Um, this month we're on Zoom. Um, if you want the login details for that, look out for Gareth's midweek message that will come out in by email on Wednesday and the code that you'll need to be able to log on to that call will be included in that midweek message. And one other thing just to finally mention is that we'll begin in from this Thursday, uh, the pastoral drop-in. We're going to be doing that on Thursday mornings. Um, if you want to make an appointment to see one of our pastoral team, you can do so through the church office. We can be called on 660-997. Um, Judith will be the person in on Thursday. So if you wanted to make an appointment on a pastoral basis to see Judith, then please contact the church office during the mornings. We try and man the church office between 9 and 1 each day. And you'll be able to make a time so that Judith can know that you're coming. Um, so we're going to now head over to uh, the, the main hall at Methodist Central Hall uh, to begin our worship. Thanks so much for joining with us today. We're thrilled that you're here and we pray uh, that you'll be blessed by our worship today. Goodbye and God bless. Only you can move the mountains. Only you can heal our
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome if you're here for the first time. We want to give you a warm welcome and hope you feel at home. And if you're here, and you always come, we hope you feel at home as well. Um, I'm just going to start off reading a psalm before we stand and worship. It says, Shout to God with joy all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. So shall we stand and worship and praise this morning? Goodness of God. 
And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able And I will sing of the goodness of God And I will sing of the goodness of God. Can we just take a minute to um, just shout out some things that we are just thankful for this morning. I just love this song because it just talks about God's goodness and just how we've known him as a friend our whole lives. So I just thought we could take a minute and if you just want to shout out um, a prayer of thanks or just something that you are thankful for this morning. And kids, you're welcome to join in as well. Yeah. Thank you, Father, that we can come into your presence as we are. You accept us just as we are, and we come to you this morning. Amen. by redeeming love before the throne above our God he pulls me close with nail scarred hands into his everlasting When condemnation grips my heart And Satan tempts me to despair I hear the voice that scatters fear The great I am, the Lord is here Oh, praise the one fights for me and shields my soul eternally boldly i approach your throne blameless now i'm running home by your blood your own into the arms of majesty behold the bright and risen sun more beauty than this world has known 
face to face with love himself his perfect spotless righteousness a thousand years a thousand tongues are not enough to sing New Testament says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Lord, in view of all that you have done for us in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in view of your great mercy, in view of his death died for us and his life lived for us, we rejoice and we worship as forgiven and free people and we offer you lord whether it's through willing hearts or whether it's through gritted teeth a sacrifice of praise today for we love you and we honor you and we celebrate your wonderful love which you have shown us in your son our lord jesus christ we bless you and we praise you in his most precious name. Amen. Amen. To please uh, grab a seat wherever you are. It's great to see you today. A very warm welcome to each and every one of you. It's so lovely to have you here with us for your benefit. If you're a guest here, my name is Gareth. I'm the lead minister here and I'll be uh, leading uh, most of this morning's service and speaking to you a little later on. Um, if you're watching online, it's great to have you with us, or if you're here in the building, equally the same. There's a few faces that um, I don't recognize, so I can offer a special welcome to you. And if you want to know anything more about the life of the church, do come and speak to me at the end of the service or the people that greeted you on the way in, and they will be able to, at the very least, point you in the direction of somebody that can tell you a little bit more. 
It's good to see some people that are part of our church family that have been watching online for many months. And I think there's a couple of people uh, who are here and this is the first time they've been back for a while. So I offer you a very special greeting as well today. It's lovely to see you in person. And for those that, for whatever reason, are watching online, we trust and pray that God will bless you today wherever we gather to worship him. It's great to see you all. Just got a couple of uh, notices which I need to give. I'll try to remember them all. Um, the first thing is a, a week of um, celebrating those that have been promoted to glory for us. Uh, David Beverly's funeral in Swansea is on Tuesday. And if you want to watch that via a video link, uh, speak to Johnny. He has the details or you should have already had them. Um, on Wednesday here at uh, 2 p.m. is Gwyneth Ashton's funeral celebration and uh, the family have asked uh, if we could wear colourful scarves to that if you are coming so um, that's your notice for that and then uh, we've also got a, a, a focus on prayer in the life of the church this year and so we've got two things uh, this week uh, in successive evenings that are focused around building up our prayer life. The first is our monthly church prayer meeting on Wednesday night, 7.30 p.m. It's on Zoom. We alternate monthly between an in-person one and a Zoom one. The link to that will be in this week's midweek message that will come out Wednesday afternoon. If you don't get that and want to, or you don't want to get it but would like the Zoom link to pray, uh, would you see Johnny or myself before you go home today and we will make sure that you get that. So 7.30, church prayer meeting on Zoom. I look forward to seeing many of you uh, and uh, looking into your living rooms uh, via the camera. And then on Thursday night at 7.30 in here... It's the first of a number of sessions that will be running throughout the next year, which are aimed at helping to equip all of us to deepen our prayer life. So it's uh, kind of hosted mainly by uh, Dave and Jane Martin. I'll be here as well doing a little bit of it. But on, uh, on Thursday night, 7.30 in here, anybody that's got a passion or an interest in prayer or wants to pick up some tips and skills to deepen their prayer life in a variety of ways why not come and join us on Thursday night at 7 30 it'd be great to see you we'll be in this room and you would be very very welcome I think that uh, those are all the notices that I need uh, to give uh, I've been away for a week, so there could be various other important things that I need to announce, and I wouldn't know anything of it. Um, but uh, unless anybody leaps up and shouts, notice! No, thank the Lord for that. We're going to sing again. And um, uh, while we sing this song, I encourage the children leaders just to wait for the, as the song draws to a, a close. Uh, but um, as it does, our children and young people will go to their section this morning. So should we just pray for them? Then we'll sing. And as the song draws to a close, which um, Denise will be in about 10 minutes time, I think, by the amount you milk it. But um, uh, uh, I've encouraged her to do that. Um, then um, children go to your uh, groups this morning. That would be uh, good. Let's, should we stand together in readiness to worship? Then I'll pray. And then the guys will lead us uh, in our next song. Father, we thank you for the gathering of your people, the church, uh, that spans generations, ethnicities, backgrounds. We thank you for the youngest among us. And as they go to their section this morning, would you bless them and go with them? Would you anoint those that teach and lead them, that through their work and efforts, uh, each child... And in fact, even each teacher might know more of the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.
than Jesus' blood and righteous man. I dare not trust the sweetest phrase, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ If you've not done so already, and we will pray uh, together. Let's pray. The New Testament says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence that we might receive mercy and grace to help just when we need it. And God, our Father, we thank you ever so much uh, that because of your saving work on the cross of Calvary and in the empty tomb, you have made it possible for us to approach you not tentatively, not with shyness, but with confidence. 
with boldness to seek your help whenever we are in need. And Lord, as we stand in the gap today on behalf of a needy and broken world, we recognise that this is a time of need. This is the day of grace just when you need it. And so uh, with confidence and with faith, we make our prayers and petitions to you. We bring before you this planet as the COP26 gathering gets underway today. Powerful and influential people gathering from all over the globe to determine how best to preserve uh, the fabric of the planet and how best to protect the livelihoods of the poorest in the world. Lord, we pray for wisdom. We pray for inspiration. We pray for good and godly decision-making underpinned by justice and righteousness. As folk gather for that conversation and meeting we thank you for this opportunity we pray that decisions made would be for the benefit of the poorest and most vulnerable on the planet Lord we pray for your church throughout the world including uh, this church here and our partners in this city centre of Plymouth. As we focus this year on prayer and faith in action, would you guide and inspire us? Would you help us to make the most of the opportunities you give to deepen our faith in both of those areas. Praying that your hand of blessing would be upon the prayer gatherings this week, that they would be significant times of renewal and refocus for each of us as Christians and for us as a fellowship. We continue to pray across the life of this church that the things that you love, Lord, would prosper and grow and the things that are opposed to your purposes would wither away and die. Grow us down in depth of love for you and out in influence in our families, in our communities, in our city that the kingdom of God might affect and change and transform lives all around this place. Pray for those of our company that are struggling at this time. We think particularly of Kay Beverly and her sons this week. Think of the family and the friends of Gwyneth Ashton. For others of our fellowship that are shut up in nursing homes with restricted access uh, to friends at the moment. For those that are watching even at the minute whose bodies are infirm or are not uh, working as they would long them uh, to work. Those that are uh, remaining at home to safeguard their vulnerable health, we pray a blessing, an abundant blessing upon each one, Lord, that your presence and your power would descend and you would greatly encourage, bear up those that are brokenhearted, encourage those that are weary, Bring healing to those that are sick. And for ourselves, Lord, as we continue to hear the exhortation of the Apostle James, 
as we continue to put our lives under the microscope of your word and as we continue to open ourselves to the conviction of your spirit would you shape and would you mold us into the people that you would have us be healthy disciples that join with others to make a healthy church that transforms the world. We ask all of these things in and through the name of the Lord Jesus who taught his friends whenever they gathered to pray the prayer that is on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. Just as Alice comes to read the word, it's one of those moments where I realise that as I announce the Lord's Prayer, I've not told the technical people to put it up. So well done, guys, you did a great uh, job. Let's hear the word of God now. Uh, we're continuing in a series from the book of James, and Ellis will read today's portion. Thank you. So it's James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. And the heading is given the title in the NIV, Taming the Tongue. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much. Let's pray together. Father, we invite the ministry of your Holy Spirit to move among us now. May the word <clears throat> which you wrote come alive for us in our hearing and in our hearts. And by your grace, 
Would you help us to encounter the Saviour In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm well aware of the irony of uh, preaching a sermon on the tongue when but 10 minutes ago I publicly mocked the worship leader for, I quote, milking the worship songs. And I was uh, just struck uh, by that um, as... uh, we were singing said song and uh, reflecting on that. So I'm sorry, Denise, I was uh, out of order for saying so. Um, uh, and it, it just brought home to me, I was well aware of this already, by the way, but it just brought home to me again how um, in preaching a, a sermon uh, such as the one that I'm about to preach, I certainly could do with a big L plate around my neck. If I, I, I would have brought one with me today. Uh, the problem is that these days, if I wore a big L plate around my leg, I'd, I'd look like a hen party going to Blackpool. But um, you, you understand uh, the meaning there. But um, because uh, I'm uh, on a journey with the things that are contained in this passage, many of us will be as well. Um, when I planned the autumn preaching plan, we worked with a bit of James, I divvied up little bits, and you know, I didn't specifically get, oh, that person will do that one because they'll be good for that. It was just who was free, what were the dates, what were the uh, passages? And I think I would have uh, perhaps found somebody else to preach on this one, uh, because I generally try and avoid uh, preaching things that um, I'm not great at living myself. Again, I reflected on that this week and then I probably preached not much of the New Testament if I applied that rigidly. Yes. <laughs> Note my wife is the one laughing heartily. And this is tough. So I, uh, in preaching this talk, I'm preaching to a mirror. All right. And uh, you need to know that. Uh, And I'm trying to let the Bible read me as much as I hope by God's grace it might read you. So receive that in, receive this in that spirit, I hope. Three things to be careful of from today's text. Firstly, be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you wish for. In my first appointment, uh, I went to visit a man. I frequently was rung up, asked to go and visit him. Um, he had a whole load of, uh, uh, of issues. Um, and in conversation to me, um, he, he once said, you know, um, he, you know, he was struggling to hold down jobs. He was uh, struggling in his relationships. He was often inappropriate with people of the opposite sex. There were all sorts of things going on and each time I'd be uh, asked to go and visit him and pray for him, etc. You know, I gladly did. But um, I remember once he said, I'd just love to do your job after another one had fallen through. I'd just love to do your job. Um, He was the one person that said, "It, it must be like living and working in heaven. I remember saying then, well, it certainly begins with H anyway. And as we converse, because, you know, I'm trying to, uh, I re- recognize that, as I've said many times, I'm a Wally myself, living among a, a, a people of Wallies. Um, you know, I'm, I, I recognize my own failings and faults, so I'm not just going to write this off. But in conversation, it became clear that that aspiration to be a, a church leader was just that. It was aspiration. Uh, And it was clear that this person felt that if they were ordained, if they were leading a church, if they were speaking to congregations, then they would get the adulation and the affirmation and the recognition that they longed for and didn't feel that they got in any other aspect of their lives. So the motive 
was, however mixed up it was, fame, really, status. James is dealing with the after effects of a false teaching in his congregation. And he's wanting to make sure that this fledgling embryonic church is set off on the right path. And so therefore, he is very cautious about who should get a platform to speak in the context of the church. Now for James, this is a, a largely a Jewish congregation. James is a, one of the most Jewish of the apostles. And so all of the kind of cultural uh, heritage that comes with them is the, the, the veneration and the deep respect that was held in first century Jewish culture for a rabbi. One who was, uh, who was knowledgeable about the scriptures. One who uh, expounded the deep wisdom of God. One who was wise and deeply thoughtful. And so James recognises that in the tradition of this church, teachers do get great respect. And so quite rightly, he says, verse 1, not many of you should become teachers not many it's a high calling it's not open to everyone now um, there's lots that our own denomination I think gets wrong but I think this they get right there's lots of things in place to safeguard so to speak at the pulpits within the Methodist church not anybody can preach and teach in our congregations. If you want to preach and teach in our uh, denomination, you need to undergo a course of study. Depending on how much time you've got and how fast you work and how determined and stubborn you are, that will take anything from 18 months to five years. As a part of that, you'll end up with lots of peer observation, other people that will be listening to you, critiquing you, offering you feedback and points to improvement. There'll be various votes from other preachers and church leaders around uh, uh, that process. There will be recommendations. There will be independent moderation of your study, all before becoming an accredited local preacher. And if you uh, feel that God is calling you for ordination, you're looking really at a five to ten year process of discernment, of, uh, of people writing reports about you, of psychological interrogation, of all sorts of things before people say, yes, on behalf of the church, we think this person is called. And so there's loads of bits of process in place that are all designed if they work the best and sometimes they work brilliantly sometimes they just become hoops for people to jump through all designed to help the church of Jesus Christ discern who the people are within its congregation and within its community who should teach and who should lead and within that ambition has no place for leadership in the church of Jesus Christ. We follow one who ended up dead. Ambition has no place. Now, there's always a little quip within the Methodist church that, um, that sometimes the best place for those people that have got a bit of a kind of wacky and weird ideas is for theological college. You know, it's best to send them there as tutors because we keep them away from real congregations, all right? That's the kind of uh, traditional quip. But of course, that's actually the worst place. I think of some of the tutors that I suffered under. And they influence generations of people through their teaching. So for good or for ill, the congregations that I serve and speak to are, are formed by extension from some of the education that I have received some of the tutoring and some of the learning that I have received. Even now, there's lots of uh, unrest within our tradition because we train people for ordination in one place that is militantly theologically liberal and, and stakes its case on, on kind of one end of the church. And so rather than having a variety of perspectives, we end up, I fear, like producing sausages from a sausage factory. 
And so we know that those who teach us are, uh, have huge influence. Think about the teachers that shaped you in education. Think about the people that may well have trained you for the profession that you are in. Think of the influence and impact they had on your practice and the things that you do on your, your belief system. And so within the life of the church, we need to be careful about aspiring to leadership and teaching roles within the church because those that do live out those roles end up having a significant influence, we hope, on people's life, faith, belief, and by God's grace, action. I mean, I, I do hope with trepidation that the stuff that I do here and speak about here makes an impact on how you live. Um, if it's not, please do say so at some stage because we could just give up this charade and go to Starbucks on Sunday morning instead. Well, I'm serious. You know, if it's making no difference to anybody, it will save me the hassle of preparing it and we could all go and do something worthwhile with our Sundays instead, couldn't we? But I hope it's having an impact. I hope it's forming us and shaping us. Now, bad teaching leads to bad practice. And James knew then that he had to address it. This is a burgeoning, embryonic, fledgling church. And so he warns those that are thinking, I'd love to be the rabbi figure. I'd love people to listen to me. I'd love the status. And James warns them against it. Jesus said, to those who, uh, to whom much is given much is expected so teachers and leaders in God's church account to God not just for our own lives which is a humbling enough thought for people like me but I believe we also account for those that we affect and those that we shepherd and influence as God's people I do believe I need to account before the Lord for how I seek to influence your life, faith, thinking, and action. So be careful what you wish for. If you sense the Lord is calling you to be a preacher, a teacher, a leader in God's church, then I'll speak to anybody about that. Really, I will. But don't expect, yeah, great, off you go, start next week. We need to be careful what we are wishing for. Secondly, be careful how you speak. Be careful what you wish for, be careful how you speak. Now, taking care of what we say, taking care of our speech, is important for James. James knows the power that words will have. In fact, so significant is the power of speech and the influence of words that James likens them to a rudder on a ship. So the tongue, the, uh, up the air, in case you don't know why I did that, you all know what a tongue is, I'd imagine. But it's what, you know, three or four inches in length, there's a, at least one GP in the congregation will probably tell me that it's longer than that and the nerves and all that kind of... But, you know, it's a tiny, compared to my leg, the tongue is tiny. Yet we know, just like a rudder on a massive ship, it's tiny, but its effect is incredible. Tiny rudder steers a huge, great barge or ocean liner or whatever it is. It may well be small in nature, but its effect is incredible. And that effect, as we all know, can therefore be for good, which I'll come to in a moment, or it can be for bad. So be careful how you speak. None of us are perfect, says James. We all stumble in many ways, verse 2. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man. He's complete, mature, whole, that's what he means. If you can master the tongue, you're well on the way to spiritual maturity and wholeness. If you've got self-control over what you say, which says James is the most difficult aspect of our personality to bring under control, if you can exercise the fruit of self-control here, here, you are more likely 
to have control over all of your being. Because we know that the tongue can corrupt, corrupt all of life. And used badly, it can lead to ungodly character. And one of my sadnesses, there are many things to rejoice about. One of my sadnesses is that there is far too much corruption of the church by use of the mouth and tongue around this congregation. Way too much of it. Too much backbiting. Too much gossip. Too much untruth. Too much speaking about people behind their back. Too much sowing the seeds of conflict and division by a calculatingly placed word which is designed to stir up somebody you know will get a, a rise from it. And when we do that, it is destructive. James likens it to a fire. Fire was the most feared disaster in the first century Palestinian uh, community. It was a desert-like atmosphere with shrubland that was uh, coarse and hard and dry all over the place. So if you lit a match, whoosh, it would go. And in a desert-like community, it was hard to find enough water to put it out. So there is destruction when the tongue is left free and unguarded and uncontrolled. You know, you know the old illustration, I did this in a school assembly multiple times. You know, you get a tube of toothpaste. I did this actually, actually just this last week we were away and um, was helping Beth my youngest daughter cleaned her teeth before bedtime. She got the toothpaste. She's becoming increasingly independent and she wanted to show me that she could do her teeth herself. So she grabs the toothpaste. You can guess what's going to happen, can't you? I don't even, don't even bother to tell the story, but I will do anyway. I can do it, Daddy. Squeeze. <laughs> toothpaste on the ceiling. And she says with this innocence, oh no, daddy, we need to put that back in the tube. Well, you know, I remember doing once a school assembly where the head teacher, after I'd finished, got up and said, you can put it back in the tube. This is how you, anyway, it was, anyway. But um, she then tried to demonstrate and couldn't do it, which was quite helpful actually, but there we are. It's a whole other story for a whole other time. But you know, once it's out, it's impossible, I think, to get it back in. So be careful, literally be full of care when you speak. Will this build up somebody or will it tear them down? Are you just trying to make yourself look better by putting somebody else down? If so, why do you need to do it? What are you trying to achieve by saying X, Y, or Z. If I really shouldn't say this, then chuffin don't. The clue is in the phrase. And if somebody comes to say that to you, you may want to say to them, well, don't then, and walk away. Be careful what you wish for, be careful how you speak. Lastly, I'm coming into land. Be careful how you praise. See, be careful how you speak, not just because of the effect words can have, but because the same mouth, says James, or observes James, is used to speak praise to God. Some American uh, film or comedy that I was watching, it's more a, a, of an American phrase, but I remember um, somebody was in a traffic queue and they're, you know, having, they're exchanging firm words. And I remember the character, I can't even remember which film it was in, replying, do you kiss your mother with that mouth? And 
the same principle applies. We are not to be two-faced, which perhaps for James is the worst expression of the misuse of the tongue. Remember, uh, at the very first circuit, uh, very first circuit we served in, we'd come to the end of our time. The, uh, we felt that the Lord wanted us to stay a bit longer. The circuit stewards thought that as well. So did our churches. And so it went to the circuit meeting where um, uh, the circuit meeting had to vote on it. And in those days, uh, it was still the old practice where um, everyone says nothing to you in person and the minister goes out of the room and then everyone slags you off. You, know, you remember those meetings. And, um, and that happened. So there's no objections in the entire process. Came to the circuit meeting. Two people objected. Well, that's fine. That's their right. They can object. Would have been nice if they told me about it, but they can object. And one of them spoke up in my absence, gave a very long speech and, uh, about you know, why I shouldn't have been re-invited to the circuit, etc., etc. And uh, it was, it, it, that was, you know, I was invited by a large majority in the end. And um, after the meeting, uh, the, this person who at this stage I didn't know had given a long speech against me, came up to me, shook my hand as I'm so pleased you're staying. And afterwards, superintendent minister said, well, these were the objections and this was the main one. Just completely two-faced behaviour. Like, you know, incredible. The balls of the guy, quite frankly. Now, James takes these sort of things seriously. We, you know, there's a tendency for us to cheapen the grace of God by reducing the severity of sin in his eyes. James pulls no punches. You know, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, this, this ought not to be so. He says that the, um, the root of all kinds of misspeech is in Satan, the evil one. So this is serious stuff. So as well as being careful then not to tear down, be careful how you praise. Um, I'm talking firstly about human relationships. Flattery is not the same as godly encouragement. Mere flattery is a lie. Saying things that you don't mean is lying. Now, there is always, always something good to say about somebody else. It may be harder at times than others to think of it, but there is always something. If you have to make a comment on somebody else, and I would underline if you have to, Focus on the thing that you can praise. Speak words of encouragement and blessing to one another. Make sure they are accurate. If you can't find anything that you think is positive and accurate, say nothing at all. Don't say something you know you don't mean. Neither say something that is negative and unhelpful just on the basis of you being truthful. There will be, on occasions, time when it's right to call other people out. Those are rare and specific. And then speak words of blessing to the Lord. Before you worship, ensure that your account is clean before the Lord. So, you know, the quip I made to Denise, who I'm no doubt is very gracious, uh, you know, I sense, I thought this is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I'm about to, you know, here trying to sing worship to the Lord, and I sense the Spirit say to me, Gareth, you shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have said that. So, you know, ensure that you're a your record, your account is clean before the Lord as much as you're aware before you come to worship him. Take care that the same tongue that sings the praise of our maker is not one that tears down other people. Because in doing that, 
you tear down something and someone that God dearly loves. That's the problem. Verse 9, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. So God, you know, James is saying, you, you can't praise God one minute and then slag off your brother the next because the God whom you praise is the same God and Father who made person A, B, or C. And so in that double-tongued, two-faced attitude, we end up actually committing blasphemy. We blaspheme the name of the Lord by cursing that which he has made. So be careful what you wish for. If you sense the Lord calling you to a, a role of teaching and leadership within God's church, wonderful. Praise the Lord. Be prepared to undergo thorough testing and discernment about that. Because it's important that we get right. And I certainly don't claim to be the finished article. I'm sure a number of you were thinking the irony of me setting out the thorough position of those that are selected for ordination in the church. And here I am. I often am aware of the irony myself. Be careful what you wish for. Be careful how you speak. Be careful how you praise. But in all of this, I really am shutting up now. I've turned the iPad off, all right? But in all of this, there is hope and there is grace. thinking this morning about what we speak but there is one who has spoken over us words of mercy and words of grace one who pours out his spirit to refine and fill and empower and shape and mould you and me to be the people that we aspire to be and so if you are like me, knowing that you are in need of grace in this area of your life, because I'm aware that I need it, then God who is faithful, number one, will forgive our sin if we confess it. And says the New Testament, cleanse us, wash us of everything in us that's unclean and unrighteous. And he will, if we ask him, empower us and equip us with more of his spirit, that more of Jesus and more of Jesus' perfect character will be revealed in you and me. So that being careful of what we say, how we praise, will become more natural, more instinctive, more implicit as a part of who we are. That's our hope, isn't it? That's the promise of God, that he is gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love and promises to fill us help us and equip us that we might better be the people God has called us to be. Be careful what you wish for. Be careful how you speak. Be careful how you praise. May God be gracious to us and mould us more and more into his people. Amen. Amen. Shall we stand together? Later on in uh, the book of James, four or five weeks on from now, 
uh, we will hear the very challenging words, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other that you might be healed. So wholeness and acknowledgement of our fallenness go together. I'm not about to preach the sermon for the next five weeks, but you know, and I just want to, as we sing our final song, uh, hymn, and as we um, begin to wrap up our formal time together, I uh, just want to make an opportunity available to any of us that need it uh, just to seek afresh the transforming and empowering grace of God which is given us by his spirit so it may well be that or in fact during the singing of the hymn if our prayer ministry team would uh, make their way to our prayer corner here it may well be that then as we sing or immediately after the service you just know that um, some of the stuff that we've done this morning and speaking about this morning, actually, you know, you need to sort that area of life out as well. As I've hopefully made abundantly clear, if that's you, you're in good company. You won't be the only one. There'll be many of us. Why not just come and sit here? And you may not need to go into great detail, but it might just be say, actually... I felt the conviction of the Spirit this morning. I felt God prompt me to say, I need more of the Holy Spirit to help me be more fully a healthy disciple of Jesus in this area. And uh, they're not going to investigate or are going to start asking you for great details. But there are folk, whether it's up close or at a distance, you have the full freedom to uh, make clear what you're more comfortable with. Uh, They will gladly pray with you and simply ask the Holy Spirit to empower and equip us all to be more and more the people of God. We're going to sing of that in our final hymn. So why don't you make your way uh, during or towards the end or even after the service is finished and people will be glad to pray with you there. Sing together, Holy Spirit, living breath of God.
your church to hunger for your way. Let your fragrance of our prayers arise. Lead us on the road of sacrifice. That in unity the face of Christ may be clear for all the world to see. Let the fragrance of our prayers arise. Lead us on the road of sacrifice. That in unity the face of Christ may be clear for all the world to see. Paul wrote to the Philippian church, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if anything is, has any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Paul goes on, whatever you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. And the blessing of God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be upon you and around you and amongst you this day and every day. Amen. If you're still engaging with the Lord, the music will play for a few moments yet. It's, uh, the time is not... Uh, elapsed which means prayer is no longer offered do make use of these guys if uh, that would be helpful if not have a wonderful week <laughs>